You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Megan Kimpisi. Authors, I have a fantastic new service to tell you about. It's called PubSite. PubSite is a service to help you build your very own website, your home on the web, where you can promote your work and give your fans a place to connect with you. PubSite is a website platform that allows every author, regardless of budget, to have a great-looking professional website developed by the book marketing professionals at FSB Associates. PubSite is the new easy-to-use DIY website builder developed specifically for books and authors. Whether you're an author of one book or 20 or a small publisher, PubSite allows you to build, design, and most importantly, update your website pain-free. No need to be dependent on a designer or webmaster to make a small but costly change to your website. Save the money and do it yourself. PubSite is the best platform for authors because it's a book-centric platform. PubSite was built just for authors and small publishers. Every design, feature, and layout is book-centric. They have customized designs for you to use. It's easy to build. No coding or HTML is necessary to create a stunning, professional-looking website with all the features you want. Get a custom domain name, yourname.com. It's simple to update. You can add all of your books, add a blog and a book tour, sell from any retailer, manage your email list and social media, and even do e-commerce. Build your website with a 14-day free trial, then pay just $19.99 per month, which includes hosting. And we offer packages starting at $499 to set up the website for you. Pub-Site.com, the place to help authors find their home on the web. Before We Ever Spoke by Dan Largent Cleveland, Ohio, 2006. After a chance encounter, three people soon find out that life can sometimes thrust us into the public eye, even when taking great measures to avoid it. Cooper Madison was the best pitcher in baseball after being drafted number one overall in 1996 from the small Gulf Coast town of Pass Christian, Mississippi. One year after announcing his sudden and shocking retirement, he finds himself seeking anonymity in Cleveland, Ohio. Kara Knox is the youngest sibling to three older brothers. After a tragic work accident to her closest relative, she has built up a tough exterior as she begins her final year of college at Cleveland State University. Jason Knox, Kara's oldest brother, is the lead detective on Cleveland's Edgewater Park Killer case. After months without a suspect, he's feeling the heat from his media-hungry chief. Serendipity intervenes, and all three learn that perception and reality are paths that rarely ever intersect. Before We Ever Spoke by Dan Largent. Hey folks, you really ought to check out Patricia Gillum's Heroes of Corvus uh, series. Uh, Book one is called A Superhero's Duty, a fight between a second-generation superhero named Red Bolt and a villain for hire named Icarus goes terribly wrong, resulting in the drowning deaths of three innocent civilians and orphaning a six-year-old boy. Racked with guilt, Red Bolt visits Cameron Wilson at the hospital every night and won't leave the boy's side until he falls asleep. Befriended by a night shift nurse, the man in costume begins to disclose what really happened after the fight and why he feels the death of Cameron's parents and sister fall on his actions. A superhero didn't survive that night and Cameron and the rest of the city are not out of danger. A Superhero's Duty, book one of the Heroes of Corvus by Patricia Gillum. Get this series now. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm super excited to have author A.P. Murray on the show with me today. She has a phenomenal new book. It's called Greedy Heart, and uh, I love this book so much. It's uh, it, it kind of hits all of of the buttons that, that I love, and uh, I think this is going to be a great new addition to your bookshelf. 
Uh, welcome to the show, Anna. Thanks, Hank. Real, I'm so glad for the compliments. Oh, you're so welcome. Um, it, they're heartfelt and 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 I mean it. Uh, so so there you go. I hope you uh, I hope you have great success with the new book. But we begin each show with the same question, and that question is: What is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Oh gosh, you know, I it almost brings tears to my eyes when I think back. I was in third grade and I was having the experience that I think so many kids do. You know, I actually, I was a teacher for a while. So I had the experience of like, okay, kids, here we go. Catch her in the (laughs) rye, you know, here we go. Grapes of wrath, you know. So in third grade, those books were more like, um, I don't know. I I remember it being wind in the willows. And I, I, I get that a lot of people like wind in the willows, but for me as a third grader, it was just not the place to start for some reason. And so I was sort of on the path not to like reading. My family was, were not readers. They were big news junkies, like you were supposed to read the New York Times. But there was, aside from the kids' stories and storybooks that you know my mother would read, Dr. Seuss, you know, there really was no next part. And so my third grade teacher... Uh, pulled a book off a shelf. You know, there was, you can imagine in the 1970s, you know, there there was this kind of um, very blonde wood bookshelf that had books lined up on it. And and there was also that box that had those cards that had grammar on them. That somehow that's <laughs> that memory. Um, and she pulled out a book called All of a Kind Family, which is a series. It's kind of, uh, it was about a, a Jewish family living on the Lower East Side. And and it was, you know, it, it wasn't, it was sort of like what you might read before you read uh, Little House on the Prairie. So she handed me that book and she said, Anna, I think you'll like this. And it, I really felt like, well, this is odd. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm not sure what I'm going to do with this. But maybe we had a quiet reading time during that period of time. And I sat on the floor and I opened the first page and I thought, holy smokes, this is reading. And I tore through that book and I, it was, I'm sure you hear this from so many writers. I've listened to your podcast, just like, you know, angels singing, dawn breaking. (laughs) And, uh, and I, then she told me there was another one. Oh, man. (laughs) It was like, you are, God, just stop. You've got to be kidding me. So I I was introduced to the idea of a novel. I was introduced to a series. And then I was off to the races. Um, But you know, the interesting thing was the experience of that novel and novel reading was so overwhelmingly magical that I became a reader, but I thought, oh, you must have to be like, I don't know, Gandalf the wizard to be able to pull this <laughs> off. Like, right. I, you know, it, it's like what I think some people feel when they see someone, you know, singing or playing the flute, like it's a superhuman talent to be able to do that. And that actually, I think, kept me from being a novelist for a long time. Just the idea that the magic of it was so overwhelming. That you know, there uh, I have heard a lot of stories like that. Uh, there, there's something magical about that uh, that day of awakening where where story just permeates and becomes. Uh, it, it's like you know, it's like discovering Gandalf. Uh, it, it, there, there's magic in the world, and it's between these covers of this book, and I get to do this any any time I want to. It's uh, it. it it's kind of an awakening of sorts. It is. It really is like, you know, St. Paul whacked off the donkey bound for Damascus. You're like, what? <laughs> this, it's, it's like entering another world. So that was, um, that was, and then I tore through everything in that genre. You know, I, I tore through the little house in the prairie series. I tore through Anne of green Gables and I, and I, and I tore through uh, little women and like then everything else Alcott ever wrote, I, you know, Secret Garden, Little Princess, that, you know, my, my reading world was that very um, female, young female reading world that 
to me, you know, so it wasn't science fiction. It wasn't mysteries. It was anything uh, in that canon of that young girl canon. Right. So when, uh, as you started discovering these books and, and devouring them, um, was there any desire to, to start writing your own stories to let your imagination run? Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. In fact, you know, the way I did it was that I would, um, when I, I would put myself to sleep by imagining stories. So whatever book that I was on, I would imagine myself in that book and I would imagine the, the story taking different twists and introducing new characters. So I did that as a form of like self entertainment or self movie telling. I just didn't think I would ever be capable of it. You know, I, I, had a, I had a dear aunt at the time, and she was the only person in our family who was a real reader. And she loved Agatha Christie, and she loved, um, you know, all, Dick Francis and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And she would, uh, she, was my, she was my mom's sister, and she was, you know, our, our, our head babysitter in the family. And she would come, and then she would narrate you know, the Agatha, because of course, you know, I was like not old enough to read Agatha Christie. Um, We're talking like I'm nine, you know, I don't know, maybe (laughs) some nine year olds read Agatha Christie, it wasn't me, but she would just start, you know, telling the story of Agatha. I I was like, I knew 10 little Indians before I, you know, I knew, uh, you know, any other big book that, you know, a kid might read. So she, so it became a form of storytelling. I just, I have to be honest, I just never imagined that I would be capable of pulling that off. And, you know, and the funny thing is, you know, I did a lot of other like stuff that you'd think would be intimidating to pull off. I started a company in a field that I wasn't, you know, acquainted with. I, you know, I went to college, you know, all of these things that, that, you know, I went to graduate school. I did I, you know, all of these things that I was like, oh, I can do that. You know, I can be an entrepreneur. Sure. I can start an internet company. No, no problem. Write a novel. Wow. That seems like that would be hard. So, so it was the, I think it's sometimes the things that are dearest to you that you want to do the most are, you know, sort of ironically the most intimidating ones to tackle. Maybe because we, we have so much emotionally wrapped up in them that, that we, we don't want to mess it up. We we don't want to do a, you know, halfway job or, or whatever it is. That's like, we hold them in, in higher esteem somehow. Yeah, no question. No question. That was it for me. I, I had a stint as a journalist. I, I had no problem, you know, going to the Bronx in the 80s and reporting on, you know, crack, like, you know, some <laughs> great, crazy stuff, you know, but but I'd still, uh, you know, I think I, for a long time, I was doing things that involved writing. I did a lot of stuff that involved writing. I taught writing. I worked as a journalist. You know, I wrote a couple of nonfiction books, business books. So I did a lot of writing. But that novel thing still had that, you know, oh, halo of, you know, the mountaintop that that is, would be very hard to get to. I think it, I find it really interesting that you separated in your mind um, the, the nonfiction writing from the storytelling, uh, if you will. That's uh, that that says a lot, I think. Yeah, you know, I I think it really does, and and I have to say that uh, my work when I worked as a journalist in my twenties, that was good training ground. I mean, I didn't, it in a way it was. So if you if I scroll back, what I always wanted to be was a novelist. You know, I that period. I think from the time I picked up that, you know, all of a kind family, I knew I wanted to be a novelist. I was just too intimidated by the idea to tackle it head on. And, you know, to be honest, you, I, I didn't come from a family of writers. I mean, you, you didn't say in my, the world that I grew up in, I mean, you said, I want to be a doctor. I want to be a lawyer. You know, even as a woman, you know, I had very, very liberal teachers, very liberal parents. If I said, I want to be an astronaut, it would have been, been like, oh, okay, fine. I want to be a writer. Mm, uh, you know, I mean, <laughs> I don't know, honey. How are you gonna make money doing that? Right. 
Uh, so that which, was a tough one, yeah. Which sadly is the response to so many kids. And I, I've talked to so many people that, you know, that became one of the first hurdles was was someone saying, well, how are you going to make a living at it? You know, and um, and, and I completely understand. I'm a parent myself. I, I know the the hurdles and 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 all of that but um uh you, you know um maybe we should be encouraging kids to pursue uh writing as a hobby there there's nothing wrong with that you know that it's that writing is the one profession that uh or, or the one enjoyment in life that we attach such uh monetary significance to i think brandon sanderson uh, was a guest on the show one time and he said you know, if, if someone goes out and, and plays basketball two nights a week with his friends, no one says, well, when are you going to join the NBA? Um, <laughs> you know, it's it, it's something you do for your own well-being, and and, uh, and we see it in that light, but we don't see writing in the same light for some weird reason. I, I love that example. Of, of Yeah, I love the basketball example. I think I've become a better uh, coach, at least, to people who are younger than I am, and saying, you know, you have to find a way to to balance it in your life. You're right. It, you're, it's not like you're going to write your first. There's a fantasy around it that you're going to write your first book and you're going to go over the moon and, and, and you'll, you know, you'll ride off on the white horse with Prince Charming and life will be perfect. And you'll sit in your beautiful office covered by flowers and probably some cats, you know, and and just write and, and the world will free you to let you do that. And of course, I'm sure that has happened to a person or two, but it usually doesn't happen. So what you need to do is to find a way to construct. If you have a, if you have to have a real, uh, you know, a day to day job, you need to choose that job carefully in a way that facilitates your your writing life, just the same way you would do if you had a kid. You know, your your example about basketball. One of the ways that I gave my permission, myself permission to write, I don't have children, um, but I know a lot of people, obviously, all, all my friends do have kids. And I, I would look at the, the women I know who became mothers and I would say, hmm, you know, they had to they had to readjust their life because daycare closes at whatever, five, six. So now they're telling their boss, I'm sorry, I got to leave. And I thought to myself, well, if I just think about treating my this writing of my novel as if I were doing the same thing around having a baby, what would life look like? And, and maybe that's particularly, you know, woman thing to do. I had to say like, okay, women have babies. I have a novel. This do- novel is my baby. Here we go. <laughs> exactly. I think that's a great way of looking at it. Um, I'm, I'm always fascinated with, with people who, um, spent time as journalist and, and then write fiction. Um, how do you feel like your time as a journalist uh, has gave you tools that you use today? Or, or do you make a connection and correlation uh, between those two things? Oh, no, no question. I, in fact, I got a, um, I went to Columbia journalism, which I think far and away of all the educational experiences that I've ever had that really, cause it's boot camp whether it's Columbia journalism or you start at the Daily News, which is sort of like the same thing, um, and then going on to newspapers, uh, you know, it is, and and some broadcast. For one thing, uh, if you haven't learned your solid rules on on grammar and how to how to write quickly and you know as error free as possible, a, a stint in journal in, journalism is going to beat that out of you. <laughs> you know, you got to. And, and the other thing is you got to get over yourself. You know, you, you can't sort of this kind of, um, I know maybe image that you have of sitting with your fist under your chin, like the thinker and waiting for inspiration to hit like there's none of that in journalism. You get your butt out there, you get the information and you write the story and the, the, and the requirements are that your writing be tight and muscular there's really a, I mean, when I said boot camp, I'm sort of not kidding. You know, there's 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 element of being in a newsroom where you've got a general barking at you and you're like, I, I'm sorry, I wrote in the passive voice. And they're like, don't do it again. You know, pay attention. And you're like, Ten, hut. you know, it's so it's that's what it's like. Oh, that that is such a great analogy. Um, And and yeah, the, those basics, those uh, th- there's just 
you have to have the tools in your toolkit and, and you can't keep going back and, uh, you know, oh, I'll do better next time. No, you, you've got to do it right the first time. And, uh, as a novelist, I, I would imagine, especially that passive voice thing, uh, you know, learning to, to keep the story engaging and not, uh, allowing the reader to, uh, you know, kind of break the, you know, the magic spell that you put on them by, you know, doing silly things like passive voice or making grammar errors. Yeah, you get you get in a, as a journalist, your skills get honed very quickly, and in a in a in, a, in an atmosphere that's, I'm gonna say severe. I know it's a tough word to use, but it it is a, it, there's a certain severity about it, and you know, looking back. When I became a journalist, I, had, I came out of college and I taught school for a couple of years, and then I went back to get a degree in journalism and then worked as a journalist. But when I started, I started work as a journalist, I had already taught AP English. So here's the thing. I thought I knew everything. I was really pretty darn convinced that I knew everything. And then when my copy would come back with a red pen all over it, and you're thinking like, Okay, it's humbling. And you can either deal with it and understand that these are people for whom writing is like going to the gym, like they're all buff in their writing and and you think you are, but you're not. You know, okay, run that mile, run that 10 miles. Okay. So so it was it is it is it was an awesome experience because it as you come to the table and try to tackle a full-length work of fiction, it's a lot easier when you have when you've done the push up so to speak right um you were also on the cutting edge uh of the uh the internet boom and uh you know were one of the first web designers and and you know uh, was uh you know, had one of the first web design firms and um you know and that that is something that we take for granted uh now you know living in twenty twenty with the way technology is, but, you know, in those early days, we really were learning how to tell stories with this new technology. I mean, that's what it comes down to is you're, you're trying to help a brand tell their story. You're, you're trying to, um, you know, find new ways of, to communicate. Um, how did, how did you get involved in that? By accident. <laughs> <laughs> like all great so, things happen. Yeah, that's right. I mean, um, it, it was sort of on a whim. I have to say, I was working, after I left education, I went to work for an educational software publisher. And you'll recall back in the 90s, like CD-ROMs were on the cover of Time Magazine. Oh, yeah. When there was a Time Magazine and when there were CD-ROMs. So I, I was working at this internet company and, I mean, this uh, ed educational multimedia company. And the management of that company, and this would have been, I would, have, I would say it's around 94 so the manager of that company is like, mm, yeah, you know, this internet thing, we, we don't think it's going anywhere. And uh, the programmers who worked at the time, obviously, they had their finger on the pulse and everybody was looking around like, uh oh, that's not a good direction for the company. So I didn't, I mean, I had an English degree and a journalism degree at the time. And the reason I was there is because I, I had experience in education and 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 by the way, if you had a journalism degree at that time, it meant that you were fairly technical. So for the time, you had edited radio tape and you were starting to edit radio on the early, you know, Apple uh, computers that the early multimedia computers, all of that was was Apple stuff. So you were you were clickboard, mouse, edit screen, graphical user interface way before other people were. That's just the way it was at the time. If you were a journalist, you were more technical than the average bear. You were writing on a computer. I, we, they people were insisting that you compose on a keyboard, which for a lot of people coming into a newsroom at the time was like, what? You know, so so again, you could compose on a keyboard, you could edit tape, you could edit video. And so that's how I ended up there. So the so the web seemed to me like just a wonderful new way for communication to happen. So a group of programmers and I jumped ship, started our own company, and I, and I really didn't think much of it at the time, which is kind of crazy. You know, it was just like, okay, you know, um, I figured this will be fine. It'll, it'll be fine. I, payroll. Yeah. Okay. It'll, it'll, it'll probably be fine. <laughs> and 
sometimes you just have to, you know, to hold your nose and jump in with two feet. And I had quickly had bunches of customers. I had uh, initially some built some uh, many brands first websites, but we were all making it up and figuring it out as we went along. So um, from there, the the business grows and, and morphs. Um, where, uh, kind of, what is the state of all that now? My business grew, and now we are a generalized technology consulting company. We still build software for people. Uh, the web, you know, software these days. Back in the '90s, it was web stuff over here. And then you might build a custom software platform for someone, you know, in the back office running on a machine that was the size of two dressers, you know, and a cabinet. Um, now we, everything, all software runs on the web. I mean, you can hardly think of a piece of software that doesn't run over the web. So that's how our business transformed. And then people need to know how to run large software projects. So I say, you know, my average day, I'm working on a project with 11 vendors and five time zones. And I also joke that my best training for this was when I worked as a teacher in ninth grade, because you're mostly saying, okay, kitties, let's go here. You do that. You do this. You do the other. Okay. Stop that. Okay. You over there, just stop that. <laughs> okay. Now you guys stop arguing, talk together. So it's, 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 it's like managing a ninth grade classroom half the time. Oh, that's so funny. That's so funny. Well, a little over a decade ago, we all uh, you know, witnessed this uh, this odd thing that happened in our economy, and it was driven. We we came to find out uh, by some underhanded dealings, uh, some some sketchy business practices that were going on in in certain segments, and uh, and as a as a company leader and and someone in the in the technology industry, you kind of had a front row seat for a lot of that, didn't you? For sure. I, I being a journal, training as a journalist, again, comes into this conversation because you, you've got, you're not afraid to learn stuff. If somebody says you're going to go out and report on nuclear reactors, you got to figure out how to report on nuclear reactors. So the, the 2008 financial meltdown, I knew needed to come into my novel. And so I needed to understand it. And there was a lot of it that was quite mathematical and quite technical. So I read everything there was, for one thing, I wanted to understand why this was happening. It was all really complicated. And, you know, there was just this alphabet soup of, you know, CDOs and, you know, just crazy stuff that was going on, bonds and subprime and mortgage-backed securities and, you know, all of this stuff. And, and I think we knew the economy was melting down. I just don't, I just don't think it was easy to get your head around why. The banks were bad. Okay. Right. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, this sort of maybe, you know, the, you know, choir boys don't run hedge funds. They never have. So what has happened to the world? So I just read everything I could get my hands on, and I began to understand, uh, as was covered in Michael Lewis's great book, The Big Short, that there was a, a small cadre of very brilliant quants and mathematicians who had figured out a way to short the 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 mortgage market these the subprime bonds and by doing that and pressing the button to do it they melted down the whole economy <laughs> and oh. many of them had deep deep regrets about it afterwards i mean they understood that they basically launched the poison pill that brought down the economy wow uh and and how did this look from from where you sat well, as a business owner, I was terrified. You know, you, I had lived through the dot-com <clears throat> uh, meltdown. I had uh, run my business through the, the, you know, through some tough times. And you see this coming, and as a business owner, you're terrified. Now, as a novelist, I had this, I was already working on my novel, which 
really has to do with the idea of the value of a home. What, is, what does a home mean? And the fact that this whole, uh, this whole meltdown was due to the, the issuing of mortgages to people who didn't, couldn't have normally gotten one. I mean, they're turning the mortgage market into a kind of like, I don't know, eBay, but you know, there, it was like stories of a cleaning lady in Queens who was, couldn't even, you know, didn't speak English, who now is on the hook for like four condos because she'd been given more, a mortgage credit to buy those condos because it was it was like spinning spinning cotton candy out of sugar the 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 bonds for these mortgages were so hot that you had to keep issuing mortgages to sort of you have to sort of like imagine like pulling recruits off the street like hey you I'll give you a mortgage well I don't even need a mortgage come on over here I'll give you one and so that's what was going on so so I had already started a novel where I had imagined there would be kind of an evil real estate component. And then here we were <laughs> with with the, with a really, you know, very distasteful in my view, you know, the idea that I, I get that a house is an asset. I get that you have a mortgage. I get that it's probably the biggest investment for most people. All of that is true and has always been true. But the idea that you're going to continually sort of flip your home as if it's as if it's a stock, you know, your home has a meaning. It's where you live. So we were commoditizing those homes into a, a something that you were going to invest in and then you were going to flip. And this is there's something wrong with that. Right. Yeah, that that really gets to the heart of uh, of of what makes uh, of of what makes a family that that's that's down to you know our it it goes to the heart of the American dream you know that that your home is is a sanctuary it's it's where we can it, it it's where all the good stuff happens and and now we're treating that like like it's just disposable and uh, so so when did you start thinking of this in terms of you know I think there's a story here. Um, you know, because you, you, like you said, you'd kind of held those things in your mind at this kind of higher level, uh, you know, writing fiction what, like, what was it about this, um, this thing that happened and the way it was affecting people that brought this alive to you in a way that, that you're like, I have to, I have to write this. I was, I'm, I live in New York. So I was here at the time and I was witnessing the, the meltdown firsthand and I already had this character in my head. I already had the character of Delia. And so Delia is, and then, and then I started to think about the fact that we don't, women, women characters, in my view, haven't, tra generally don't travel the arc of redemption that male characters do. So because you're, it's difficult to write a, a woman who's unlikable. Um, and at the time, to me, the issue of greed was really fundamental to this all. That, you know, I, it, someone early on joked that, that she thought, you know, the, the Gordon Gecko greed is bad. She just, she, greed is good. She just thought the tagline for my novel should be just greed is bad. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's the tagline. Not greed is good. Greed is bad. Right. So, so I had this idea that what, what was the problem here? What was the problem in all of this? It was greed. So how do, so I wanted to get at the heart of the story, which is choosing whatever the opposite of that is. And I, I had to think about that a lot, but whatever the opposite of greed is, how do you get there? So we were living through this catastrophe. It was almost handed to me. I, again, I already had this idea of this, of this woman who was going to choose home in the end. Just choose home. That was the big idea. And then the, the mortgage subprime thing dropped out and Bear Stearns declared bankruptcy and some of these cataclysmic things that nobody had ever imagined 
were happening. And I thought, well, here it is. You know, this is the consequence of greed. And unfortunately, the world and the planet has to keep relearning that. But right. but this is the consequence. So so here we go. Where do we start? I knew where she was going to end. But now I was being given the material for where she needed to start. Oh, man. Um, so, you know, did did you just uh, sit down and start writing? Did Did you tell anyone about this? Or is this just kind of in your mind, was this, uh, you know, let me just explore this and, and see where it goes. What, what was your, your, your thinking and your attitude uh, during the time? Well, I did just sit down and write for sure. And, um, and I, when I'm, you know, it's funny, you were asking a minute ago, like how journalism, you know, figures in. Well, one of the things that I, it happens when you're a journalist is that you, you can be a very fast writer. And so I'm, a, I'm a fast writer. Like I, I produced 30,000 words and then they were the wrong 30,000 words. <laughs> and then I'd start again. Turns out you can have a lifetime of reading and writing nonfiction and, and, you know, thinking about writing novels and reading novels and stuff and not know how to write a novel. So I ended up with hundreds of pages that didn't do it. Like, did it, they weren't ending. <laughs> I didn't have structure. So, so then I had to figure out a way to really learn how to write a novel that hung together the way I understood a novel hanging together. You know, the, the kind of novel I like to read. How do you do that? And it's true. You can go through a lot of education, college, journalism school, teaching English, and not know how to write a novel. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a struggle that a lot of people can can relate to. Um, so as you start, you, you talked about writing 30,000 words and then realizing that they're not the right 30,000 words. Um, you know, how do you start working your way through the morass that is, um, you know, and, uh, doing it wrong? Uh, how did you start to get some clarity on it? I happened to have a fortunate experience where I went to the right, the correct writers conference, just the, the, the it was kind of like just the ticket and, uh, a woman who teaches at Florida International University, her name is Lynn Barrett, taught the, the seminar that I went to was over five days. And she, you know, the funny thing is she went back to Aristotle's poetics and structured the course based on that, which is that classical drama is about reversal. If you want a character to end up up here, and my hand's like above my head now, they got to start down here. So take Cinderella. She starts in the ashes. She ends up in a ball gown. So structuring your plot in a way that has that kind of arc was a very basic concept that was a, like a light bulb for me. Like, oh, yeah, okay, that makes sense. And then... So and you wanted and, and another thing she recommended is you want to avoid characters sitting in a chair thinking. And I was like, mm, I got like, I got like 15,000 pages of sitting in a chair thinking that, okay, that, that's got to go. And that your subplots are little gears that move the main plot along. So when I had some basics of like, here, you know, here's how you do it. And plenty of people have, have gone to similar seminars that talk about the hero's journey and structure and the big black moment. Oh, you know, honestly, all of that was new to me. I thought just because I read a lot of novels, I knew that stuff and I, I really didn't. So once I kind of got that down, then I said, okay, I can do this. So it was really a seminal moment. It's like, okay, if the character is going to end up choosing home, she has to start out the opposite of that. And subplots are little gears that move the plot, and each scene needs to be a unit of change towards that. And so that some of these very basic rules were uh, 
that was it. And now then it took me quite a while to map it all out. I, I know that you've talked to tons of writers and some of them are pantsers and some of them are plotters. And I, I started as a pantser and I ended up saying, OK, well, if I'm going to figure this out, I mean, I, I don't work on like spreadsheets. I got like tons of circles and lines drawn. I mean, it looks like I'm mapping out a murder scene. But it's the way it's the way it came together for me. And I and, it, and you know, the other thing is that the I think the plot of Greedy Heart is a fairly complex plot. When people read the synopsis, they were like, this is a complicated plot to tackle for your first novel. I'm like, yeah, but that's what I got. Um, and so I so I sort of, you know, instead of building like a, a one story house as my first house, I sort of built, a, you know, an apartment building. Right. Um when you you said that you had this uh the character of Delia that that she was the first one that came to you um what do we find uh, how does Delia uh come in contact uh, kind of face to face with this crisis that that we talked about earlier and how does that affect the plot of the book well Delia starts out she wants to make money and you got that from page 1 she she says she says love is not my goal it's money and that's because she has had she's lost a great fortune in her childhood so she she is absolutely clear i i want to make money and then she gets an opportunity to work on wall street and she realizes this is not just money this is the kind of money that will reconstitute a lost fortune and that it that just sings to her. Okay, I'm in, a- and in for all of the corruption and double dealing and insider trading. Like that is she's down with that. So she was she's a character built for that moment. Here we go. I'm gonna make my money. And and then. Uh she gets caught up in in uh like like you said we know right from the beginning what her mo is i mean from page 1 literally um there there's a lot going on there and we we see you know what she thinks about uh people and using them and 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 all of that um and you, you mentioned uh you know she sees that this is it, the, maybe the way to reconstitute a, uh, you know, a lost fortune. And so we've got some family drama that plays into that and, and how that affects her motivations. Um, there's a lot going on in this book. Like you said, there's, you know, pretty complicated plot, but uh, tell us about some of the other characters uh, that we meet uh, throughout the book. Well, so a lot of the characters, you know, one of the things that that's true is that I actually had a, a, a life like what Delia describes. I was born in my father's family was enormously wealthy, industrialist family. And we had based by the time I was, let's say, 14, 15, we were normal middle class. So Delia experiences that. And her mother uh, in the story is a world famous fashion model, which is also was true in my life. My mother was on the cover of Vogue magazine. She was Eileen Ford's top model. And the mom character in this story is a, which could describe my mother, is a, although my mother's much older now, but is a 70 year, 70 ish sort of exquisitely beautiful woman who is very cold and very estranged from her daughter. So, a lot of folks who've read the book just love the mom character because she hasn't seen her daughter in five years. And she looks up from her needle pointing and says, I hope you'll do something with your hair before tomorrow. So mom is a mom's a mom's a little tough to take. Yeah. And she's a card. She, she is definitely a card. We also have the, uh, uh, Delia when she's now, as you might imagine, in financial straits at some point in the book in a rent controlled building in New York city. And there is an, an Irish, a female Irish super. I love, I had so much fun with this character because in New York city, you know, there's uh, buildings have superintendents and superintendents are guys, right? Doormen are guys too. Like 
when did you ever see a doorman who wasn't a guy? It's a, it's really interesting, and it partly it's because these these roles are passed down in like like fiefdoms. So you get you have a super, and then you have the son of the super, and then you have that guy's nephew, and so it's it's kind of a self perpetuating thing. I thought to myself, what if, what if we had a woman super? So this character sprung into my and every every other word out of her mouth is the f word. And she, you know, she she beats pigeons with her broom. And she has known the family. She's known the family that my main character Delia is from because they are in the neighborhood. And she she just looks her up when she, when when my character Delia has fallen, she just looks and is gonna be in this building, this rent control building. She just peels paint off the wall with the, you know, the tongue lashing she gives, uh, you know, our, our heroine. So another, another super colorful character in the book. That's so funny. Um, this, this book, uh, there, there's so much going on, uh, in, in this book. It is such a fun read. Um, how would you describe, uh, the genre of this book? Because there's there's intrigue, there's mystery, there's um, you know, there's kind of you know some some white knuckle moments. Um, how do you, how do you describe the book to people? Well, it's we're currently saying that it is uh, the Dutch House meets the Big Short. So, you know, I think it is actually a little hard to characterize, which which is an interesting phenomenon in publishing, right? Because I, and I completely get it. Your, your book needs to be shelved with other books. And I just had a review come out this morning that was it was a good review and uh, and called it a romantic thriller. And I'm, I'm all right with that. I think, you know, I, I'm, I'm OK with that. It's it's a you story. Go, well, yeah. And <laughs> and I, I mean, I think that there's been a really passionate group of supporters, my, my publisher, uh, my agent, a passionate group of supporters around Greedy Heart. And it folks will say that it is a little difficult to, to classify. It's a, it's a family story, like, I don't know, like Downton Abbey. It's got, it's got masterpiece theater elements of it. And then, you know, it has, you know, kind of I capture the castle elements of it with, you know, a, a family on hard times. And then it, it also has some, some rom-com elements of it. You know, you've got a runaway horse in Central Park and a, you know, a, a, and a, a parade around that. So it, it's got, you're right. It's got a lot of things going on. And it has been in its in its life through getting an agent, selling it to a publisher. It has been classified and reclassified a couple of different ways. Right, right. Um, Anna, uh, you're publishing the book as A. P. Murray, um, and we we were talking for just a minute before we started recording, and um, and you mentioned uh, something about that, and I said, well, let, let's save that for the show, and let's. Let's talk about that. Um, why did you choose to to publish under that uh, moniker? Well, it's interesting. It goes back to what I was just saying about how folks who read the book and were passionate about the book then helped me decide how to present the book to the world in a way that people could understand. So first, this book was classified as women's fiction. And the first covers that came out were communicated that. I mean, they weren't like two Adirondack chairs. It wasn't that, um, but it was. It was. They were the the covers were more feminine. And then my terrific publisher uh, Tuli and the my 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 great editor Kelly Hunter just sat me da- down and said, "You know what? I know you thought you were writing women's fiction. I get it, but we think this book is more than that. We think this book is fiction capital F." Now. I get that. I mean, I, I, I've just started this interview saying, my, like, what I read is Secret Garden. What I read is like Little Women. So so I, I don't have any negative association with being classified as women's fiction. I was all in. But the idea was that, you know, unfortunately, men may be reluctant to read a book that's written by a woman. So... And now I think it's a little bit of a shell game because I, you know, there's so many women who are publishing first initial, middle initial, last name, 
it's like you're not you're not kidding anyone. Everybody knows that you're a woman. It's like who do you think you're fooling? But I think it does communicate that a, a kind of story where the main character is a woman, but it's not about let's say a purely female experience. The the experience could have it happens to be happening to a woman, and of course the fact that it is a woman is important in the story. I, I don't know that I could write from a man's point of view. Maybe I could, I don't know. But but the fact that she is a woman is not material to to that she starts out in a state of greed. That's a human condition. It's not like I'm having a baby. Woman's experience. I want money. Human experience. General. So so, you know, I, when I was approached and asked, would I put my name on the cover as A.P. Murray? I, I was like, well, sure, I'm all into that, too. Like, <laughs> it's like, it doesn't change who I am. It doesn't change who the book is. But I, it, I think it can help a reader understand, hey, what, how do I interpret this book? Right, right. I, I, I think, yeah, I, I understand that. I hate that it's that way, but I I understand what uh, uh, why you did that for sure. And we, you know what's funny is that it it kind of worked. I had a uh, an article I was in a roundup of of top books you know this week, and the reviewer wrote the or the it's not a review it was a roundup. So the writer, I was he throughout that thing. Oh my goodness. <laughs> So there you go. <laughs> oh, silly, silly people. Does it matter? No, it doesn't. No. It doesn't matter. Yeah, we, we want the story out to as many people as as, as we can. That's the, that's the important thing. Um, well, today is release day for Greedy Heart. Uh, congratulations, uh, Anna. We, we hope that, uh, that everyone will grab a copy. There's links to it in the show notes this episode. If people are just learning about you and want to find out more about you and connect with you, is there a place they can do that online? Absolutely. My website is AnnaPMurray.com. Excellent. We'll put a link to that as well in the show notes. Uh, Anna, this has been so much fun talking. Um, we're going to send everyone to pick up a copy of Greedy Heart. And uh, congratulations. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks so much, Hank. Delighted to be here. <laughs>